Testing. Oh, wonderful. You can hear me. All right. Go ahead and take your seats, please. We're going to get started in just a few moments. All right, good morning everyone. Thank you for coming out on this surprisingly chilly day. If you are as prepared as me, then I'm sorry because I am not prepared for the winter, but thank you, it's warm indoors. Um, and welcome to our November cooking class. This is the theme for today's cooking class is healthy recipes for the holidays. And if you're new to our group, we are the Elmhurst Seventh-day Adventist uh, Community Lifestyle Center. We love to connect with people. We love to share messages and education around health and what holistic health can really mean through our online and in-person meetings, seminars like today and cooking classes and whatnot. So thank you for joining us, whether you are a part of our in-person attendance or you're joining us online, we're happy to have you. As part of our group, what we like to do at the beginning of every event is to just practice a moment of thankfulness and self-reflection. So if you would like to join us in prayer, you can, you are, we're not going to force you by any means, um, but we're going to take a quick moment uh, just right now to pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time and for bringing us here safely. We humbly ask that you please be with this event, help us to connect with each other, and to learn more about what healthy can look like and all the wonderful opportunities it holds. Thy will be done, and in the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, so a quick housekeeping, or yeah, a couple of quick housekeeping items. If you would like to have a pencil while you're going through the recipes, maybe to make a couple of notes, I'm going to put some pencils out in just a moment, but um, we're also going to just let you know where the bathrooms are, especially if you are new to this building. If you just go through these buildings, or <laughs> through the buildings, if you just go through this door right here, the bathrooms are gonna be on the right. Um, we have the female bathroom, then a water fountain, and then the men's room. So if you have any questions throughout the event, feel free to ask myself or a couple of the others who are here on our health team. But otherwise, we are going to go ahead and get started. And first up on our stage is Judy. She is going to walk us through an Italian antipesto. Good morning. Well, I'm going to start with, I guess, a very good starter dish. But before we start cooking, and while Sharina gets out the pencils, because there is going to be one um, important clarification on here. So um, maybe she could just pass some of those out. Um, how many of you are hosting Thanksgiving or Christmas? Mm, there's some hands. Okay. Well, I'm just going to be a shameless promoter. This recipe's for you. Okay. How many of you will have company and be hosting? Oh, more people like me because my kids live a ways away. So this recipe is for you because if you make it ahead a day, oh, it just tastes better the next day. And if you have it for Thanksgiving and you have another meal to prepare for the weekend, it tastes really good to have it just right out of the refrigerator. So um, how many of you are carrying food to somebody else's house? See, this recipe is for you. Just throw the lid on. It's very compact. It's called salad, but it's not going to like take up the whole space to put it together or to serve it. And then how many of you are cooking with kids? If you're not, you could be. And um, David and I were laughing because I couldn't bring my kitchen sink today. I had to bring my fancy tool, and this is great for kids because that means they can open a can safely and in my case, I put the, we did it this morning because we had to drain into the kitchen sink, and I still wanted you to see all the ingredients the way they were. So um, we're going to get started with this in a minute, but we're going to start with the dressing. So go to your um, worksheet under dressing ingredients. Um, we just got a little typo here. It's Italian seasoning here, right here. 
and not Italian dressing, because actually it's the dressing that we're going to start with and I'm going to show you how to make. So, and at the bottom, um, I think maybe in a, in a bottled Italian dressing, there might be something that wouldn't be vegan if that's important to how you're choosing your food. So just cross that out because this whole thing is vegan. I've never added anything to it that wasn't. And so another reason why it's very good for a buffet is that you put it out and there's not a thing in it you have to worry about going bad or um, anyway. And good for you too. So um, skip down to uh, dressing because when you read down in directions... Um, these ingredients are going to go in the bowl, and then the dressing ingredients I need to bring to a boil, which I'm going to do, get my little hot plate on here. Okay. And it needs to cool just for a minute, and then we'll be ready to pour it over the salad. So if you don't mind skipping forward, we're going to put, start with the olive oil and put in two-thirds cup of olive oil. The dressing is a big part of this salad. So what I decided I wanted to highlight is that if you're going to skip to saving yourself some time, don't skip with um, dried garlic and don't skip with a bottled uh, lemon juice. I did it once. I, bought, I buy these little bottles of lemon juice from produce, and it says not from concentrate. And I had so many things going on, and I thought, oh, I just don't have time. Oh, I could taste the difference. I've made this recipe for 45 years, so I could taste the difference. And, you know, I'm already using products that are not exactly fresh from my refrigerator. But for me, this, this recipe is... Um, a time saver. It's it's uh, it's what my family loves, and it was my mother-in-law's recipe, so it was something my husband loved as well. So, anyway, don't skip on the lemons and don't skip on the garlic. So I've already got my lemon juice squeezed. That's usually my husband's job, or it could be the kid's job. And I better turn this down. I'm not used to that. Okay. So the, the other thing I want to show you is that um, I grew up, uh, my mom fixed Lebanese food for my dad. That was his culture. And uh, my mom was a very good cook, and I didn't really learn how to do anything uh, except, you know, she would say, Judy, set the table, mash the garlic. So I decided for today's presentation, I ought to do what I'm really good at, what I grew up doing, and what I don't want you to skip. So I want you to choose three really nice, fresh cloves of garlic. And when I see this little green tail coming out and it's getting a little sprouty, now I just bought that on Thursday. Um, sometimes I think it gets like that in my refrigerator, and then I'm like, oh, I should get fresher garlic. Anyway, this is fresh garlic. So you want to um, get it started into a few little pieces. And then um, I put the sugar and the salt together into this. And what's, what's required for mashing garlic is that you need some grit. So um, that's what we're doing. And... So when I was little, I would be taking maybe one clove of garlic and maybe, I don't know, not that much salt. And um, it needs to mash up into something that looks a little bit like, maybe like the consistency of toothpaste. If your garlic is really fresh and um, wet, then... You know, if you were making this for a salad, you'd maybe add a little more salt. But I'm watching my salt these days, so um, we're just going to use the amount it says because um, this is a recipe rather than just something that we're doing for a salad. Um, now, I was going to show you one other thing, and I already dumped it in. But what I like to do is take this mixture 
with the salt and the garlic and put it in my lemon juice first because that helps it really dissolve really well. Once you have the oil mixed in, um, uh, then it's coating things. Anyway, that's just a, sm that's a small thing. So let's get this in here because we have olive oil, lemon juice, minced onion, done, salt and sugar. So let's get this in. I'm gonna bring this to a boil while we get everything else in the bowl. Another good job for kids. Yeah, like I grew up, that's what I did. Now, the other thing I really like about this recipe is when you're feeding a bunch of people, um, not everybody's the biggest fan of onion, raw onion. Not everybody's the biggest fan of raw garlic. If you don't grow up with those stronger flavors, sometimes that can be a, a little bit of a put off. Um, but when you are bringing it to a boil, you're just taking off that edge, but you're keeping all that really good flavor. So we're going to do this. Oh, one other thing. The part that we're going to mark on here, the Italian seasoning, OK? So cross out dressing. No, no, we're making the dressing. So Italian seasoning is right in here, and we're going to put that in. OK, now this is ready to come to a boil. So, OK. So with my magic can opener now, let's go back to the top. We need some mushrooms. We were talking in the kitchen. Um, you know, all of us keep a pantry with some canned goods in them. If you were a person that this was the one thing you were going to make and you said, I don't want to use canned mushrooms. I want to use fresh mushrooms. Oh, sure, go ahead. I mean, it, it's just another step. Uh, for me, uh, when I have three meals a day and 10 people in the house and, you know, lots of things going on, I'm not starting with fresh mushrooms. But um, there's not a thing wrong with that. So putting in a lot of color with the, with the carrots. Love that. Um, artichoke hearts. I bought these already quartered. Um, sometimes I will cut them in half again if they're too big, and maybe we'll do that real quick. Because you do want everything dispersed very nicely for, for the recipe. If you buy them whole, then just make them just sort of bite size. That's the other thing that's really nice about using the canned carrots, because they're already just, everything ends up being kind of in the same size. What am I on top of here? Move you off. Okay. Get these done. What's the next thing? Oh, this is boiling. Yay. Okay, we're boiling. We're going to turn you off. And we're going to put you right here to cool just for a second. And get these in. OK. So what have we got next? Here we are. Uh, let's do, oh, she gave me a garbage can. Let me get rid of all of this stuff. Garbanzos. Now, I put some sizes, and then I went to the grocery store. I had uh, written to David the recipe when I had a, a larger one can of garbanzo, so I think I put on there one 19-ounce can, because that's what I had at home. Then when I went to the grocery store, I thought, this is really the more standard size. Um, and you could just do one, but the garbanzos are what I really like. Oh, four minutes. Okay, here we go. We're going fast now. I like olives, so if you, if you want, you can do this. But I want you to know that this is the kind of recipe that, oh, you forgot to buy the two little cans. 
It's okay, just use the one little can. Um, I don't think I'm gonna use them all. Um, sometimes I buy the green olives and the little skinny one, then maybe you'd use the whole thing. Um, for purposes today, I, I drained a little bit. And maybe that much. Okay. And I don't usually buy pimento. I just let the pimento that comes with the green olives be in there. And, and for a long time, I couldn't find this. But um, I found it so easy when I was doing things. So I thought, okay, um, it really adds some beautiful color. I don't really know what pimento tastes like. Do you know? It, is it spicy? Oh, Victor says yummy. Put it in. Okay, so did we get everything? Somebody, ch oh, celery. Okay, celery for crunch. And do not put the celery in there. I did it one year. I got, I was going fast and I did the onion and I just threw it all in with the celery and it was like, oh no, celery's in there, not supposed to be because I want it crunchy. But all was, you know, nobody else noticed. I was the only one that knew that. Okay, did we get everything? I think so. The dressing is done. David's going to say two minutes in a minute, but I'm going to be done. So here is the dressing. Oh, you guys, it smells so good. I wish you could be up here right now, but we're going to eat it, so um, you'll be able to taste it then. So here we go. Now, that is a like, that seems like a lot of dressing, and it, it sort of is. It's, it's, a, um, it's a dish that has um, dressing at the bottom. So after we stir this, I will show you how much sauce is still at the bottom. And I brought small cups for us to serve with because I want you to have some of that juice. And we brought some breads because it's really good to serve on the side of a plate. It's not the best to like put on your big buffet plate and then the juice goes everywhere. I'm one of those kids that doesn't want that to mix with that. So I usually serve it in something like this and you get a little bit of everything and color. Um, if I were at home, I would be tasting it. So, hey. And you can decide, hmm, it needs a little more lemon or it maybe needs a little finishing salt. So here's some finishing salt. And bon appetit. So um, great salad to take. You put your lid on that, put it in the back of your refrigerator. You make it on Thanksgiving. You could make it on Wednesday morning. Done and done. And still use it later. Thank you. Oh, one thing. My best friend made this, and then she was serving a whole bunch of people. So she literally doubled the recipe, cooked up some pasta, threw it in. You have all that extra dressing. And now, or if you, you know, just wanted to make it extra for the weekend or whatever, very good to do that too. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Oh, my word. Okay, let's fix this recipe. Yeah, I missed that. I am so sorry. Um, so it is, here, here. This is what we needed to do. So three cloves of garlic. Can you write that in? Ah, I am, thank you for catching that. We got the onion on there, right? Yeah. Okay. Did you see, if you see anything else, I think we're good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, green olives. I bought them this way. Usually, I've never seen them already sliced, but you know, I'm going for all the help I can have because I don't have little kids in my kitchen anymore. So if you buy the whole ones, you can slice them in <coughs> half. Just so that, because everything else is going to be sliced. Sliced black olives, sliced everything else. So. Yeah, thank you All for right. making that clarification.
Thank okay. you. And for those of you who are tuning in online, the questions were simply about the garlic as that was left off of the ingredients list, but you are going to add about three cloves of garlic to what was made here. And um, the pimentos and olives were bought slice that was another question um, and so now what we're going to do is transition over to our next demonstration which is going to be our minestrone is it minestrone do i say it like that okay perfect thank you you can tell how often i have it but it smells wonderful in our kitchen so if you can't come down uh, if you weren't able to come down today make sure you join us next time all right so we're just going to take a moment to transition and then doug is going to get started Good morning, testing, testing. Uh, so this is going to be a problem because in my mind's eye as I was rehearsing, he was to my left. <laughs> I immediately noticed when Judy had her burner to the right, I was like, oh boy. Okay, so Doug and I are going to walk you through preparing a soup today. Well, I should be more clear. I'm going to do most of the talking, walking you through a recipe, a great minestrone recipe that Doug uh, found last winter. <clears throat> there are a couple, at least one thing, or two things actually we want to clarify in the list of ingredients. So you will need two tablespoons of olive oil, a medium onion, two medium carrots chopped. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that we've essentially diced them by quartering each slice. Alternatively, you could shred them, but if you did that, you might want to pat them dry. Uh, two celery stems or stalks, uh, sliced thin. Uh, the recipe here says a tablespoon of salt, change that to a teaspoon. Uh, half a teaspoon of freshly ground black pepper, a 28 ounce can of diced tomatoes, oh, three cloves of garlic, sorry, skip that one, crushed, a 15 and a half ounce can of cannellini beans, a cup of green beans chopped is what it says. I can tell you that it's more like a cup of chopped green beans. Um, that's what we've done today anyway. It won't alter the recipe, recipe too dramatically or so that it's unrecognizable if you do a cup of green beans chopped instead of a cup of chopped green beans. Four cups of vegetable broth, three bay leaves, a teaspoon of dried oregano, a teaspoon of dried thyme, and a cup of small pasta. Okay, so Doug started out in the kitchen by sauteing the first six ingredients. Uh, which are the onions, carrots, celery, salt, and black pepper in the two tablespoons of olive oil. So he got that started, and he'll continue to do that for the next few minutes. You want to saute those for about 8 to 10 minutes total. He's probably 5 or so minutes in, so we won't need to wait so long. In the meantime, have you ever noticed uh, restaurant menus often have a section called soups and starters? 
That is because soup is a great start to your meal, particularly a broth-based soup. Why is that? It does a couple of things. First, you will feel full, fuller sooner because of the high water content in the soup, and you're also front-loading your meal with vegetables, and who can't use more vegetables, right? Um, so you're actually, by introducing this soup to your holiday table, you're doing your guests a favor uh, by introducing those additional veggies, but theoretically, you could also save on how much of the main dish they'll eat. So you might be wondering, minestrone, isn't minestrone just vegetable soup with noodles in it? Is it? Well, uh, partially. The answer is yes, partially. Uh, minestrone originated in the south of Italy, and it adds a pasta and a legume, or a legume. Both pronunciations are correct, I verified. Um, so today we're using cannellini beans uh, here, uh, which is a white bean. Some recipes, you, you could replace the white bean actually with a kidney bean. Uh, a garbanzo without altering too dramatically the texture or the flavor of, of the recipe. Um, a great northern bean, uh, we can talk about the difference between cannellini and great northern, because uh, there is a little bit of a difference. If you want to do something very traditional, you could use a berlotti bean, which is a white bean with uh, red or crimson striations, which sounds super fancy and festive for the holidays, However, while I can't confirm, I understand that they turn brown when you cook them. So if you think they're going to look like that in your final product, they won't. But they'll, it'll be fun to prepare anyway. Um, okay, you could also use a fava bean, uh, which is a broader, flatter bean, kind of like a lima bean. Uh, that would be fine too. So the difference between the cannellini and the great northern bean, they look nearly identical. Uh, and you often find them on the grocery store shelf right next to each other. And you're looking at the cans going, what is the difference? There is a difference. Uh, the cannellini bean is textured more like a kidney bean. It has a thicker flesh, a little bit meatier um, than the Great Northern. Trust me, that I can verify. Because I was eating something, I'm like, what is that? Um, and that's what it was. There was a difference. Okay. Uh, for the pasta, some replace pasta with rice. Personally, I'm not a fan, but you can use whatever shape of pasta you would like. Uh, today, we're going to use this pasta whose name literally means little ear, orecchiette. Um, we'll use that. I like it. It's small, but kind of bulky. Um, so it adds a little bit more, uh, makes the soup a little bit heartier. Uh, but you could use, um, I like ditalini also in this soup. You could also use a mini penne, a small shell, you could use rotini, you could use bow tie. I've actually seen this soup with a large shell, um, which makes it a little bit different as well. Okay, uh, so it's the addition of the legume and the pasta that makes for a heartier soup than your run-of-the-mill vegetable soup. Word to the wise. Uh, soup is much more fun to make if you prepare your vegetables ahead of time. I am the queen of poor timing in the kitchen. Yes? Is that correct? It's true. I'm the worst. The worst. Um, never can I get everything ready at the same time or right when I want it, so I'm terrible. So I've learned this the hard way, that if you prepare all of your vegetables and ingredients first, uh, you won't be rushing to catch up and things will be more evenly cooked, etc. So are we ready? We are ready. Okay. This is where it gets fast and furious. Once your sautéed ingredients are ready to go, again, that is the first six ingredients on your list, um, you can start adding the rest of the ingredients with the exception of the pasta. Do not add the pasta yet. So garlic, three cloves. If you haven't stumbled onto this little miracle, look for it in your freezer section. I love this. Um, but then again, it's three cloves of garlic. It's very easy to mince it, uh, crush it directly into the soup. It's fine. But I do love these, and this is what we're using today. Um, so that's your garlic. Uh, tomatoes. You'll add the 28-ounce can of diced tomatoes. If it's important to you, you can use a low-sodium variety. Green beans. You could use frozen, pre-cut, 
uh, green beans. Today we're using fresh chopped green beans. Just prepare them by washing them and cutting them to your desired length. The beans, again, today we're using cannellini. Uh, you'll want to make sure that you're uh, draining and rinsing these uh, before putting them in the soup. And again, you could substitute with a kidney bean or a garbanzo without changing the flavor or texture too much. For the broth, we're using a low-sodium vegetable broth today, uh, four cups, which is exactly this. Just dump it right in. Oh, he's doing. Um, bay leaves. You'll drop three full bay leaves into the soup for flavor. And then your oregano and thyme. Did you pre-measure these? No? Uh, no. A teaspoon of each of the oregano and thyme. Once everything is in, you're going to cover it and cook for 20 minutes. Then you'll add your pasta. Once you add your pasta, leave it uncovered and cook until your pasta has achieved your desired level of doneness. Um, to get really fancy on your holiday dinner table, you can top this with a bit of shredded or grated uh, Parmesan cheese or vegan Parmesan cheese. Or, if you have more time on your hands than I do, you could make some large croutons and drop a couple in each bowl. It makes me chuckle because I'll tell a quick story. Um, my mom, who is here, once told me that she made homemade English muffins. And I just kind of sat in stunned silence. <laughs> like, what? Um, and what I told her, that the day she finds me making homemade English muffins, it will mean I officially have absolutely nothing else to do. Um, homemade croutons falls in that same category for me. But it probably would be pretty to have some really large uh, croutons to serve, uh, serve with that. Uh, the other thing I'll add is that, like most soups, you have the flexibility to add or swap out ingredients. Um, probably changes it from a true minestrone, but you could throw in leftover broccoli. Um, I personally would like mushrooms in this soup. I'm a fan of the mushroom. Um, some minestrone recipes call for asparagus or turnips, uh, so I think that would be fine. And you can also play with the seasonings a bit. There's no reason that you couldn't add a little bit of basil or parsley to this. Um, some people might find that they prefer more salt than the recipe calls for, but not the tablespoon. Don't do the tablespoon. Change it to a teaspoon. Um, and then salt after. Uh, so our plan is to finish up this batch, have it ready for you to taste at the end, but are there any questions? Okay. I didn't even get the time warning, I don't think. Um, yes, question. No, I have never made homemade English muffins. It will probably be many years before I get to that. Probably. Anything else? I have a question. How did I do? <laughs> You kept up quite nicely. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I would say, uh, so the question is, uh, what I mentioned about the mushrooms, asparagus, broccoli, and stuff at the end. If you wanted to change up the recipe, or you had leftover broccoli or something in your fridge that you were trying to use, I don't see why you couldn't throw it in. I have seen some minestrone recipes actually call for asparagus and turnips. Um, someday I'm going to try it with the mushrooms. Go ahead, Carmen. Ooh, cabbage, yeah. Yeah, ooh. Okay. Cabbage, kale, and spinach. It's a good way to get your kale, and I guess you could throw in a little bit. That's a great idea. Yeah, so a lot of flexibility um, in this and, you know, just like other soup recipes as well. Anything else? Okay, thank you.
All right, thank you, Doug and Nancy. And up next, as we transition, we're gonna give Doug and Nancy just another moment before they step off the stage, and then Mick is going to come up and show us a recipe of Colcannon. I believe I pronounced it right. Wonderful. Is it time? Are we on? Okay, it's, um, it's my turn. So uh, a couple of corrections on the recipe. Um, it's C-O-L-C-A-N-N-O-N -N -N instead of C-A-L. And you can put a parenthesis, the letter V, because our recipe is vegan. So... If that, if that is important, but that's uh, where we're doing it today. We are vegan. Behind every good woman is a man. And I've got my able-bodied wife here is, is assisting me, so I'm going to do the talking, and she's going to be doing the doing. And uh, what we have here is uh, uh, the recipe says to turn the oven on and get that heated up, and you want to cook your potatoes in advance. But I think the most important thing to do is to... Uh, is to cook your vegetable broth. So we've made uh, a vegetarian broth, and what that consists of is uh, celery, carrots, onions, and a te quarter teaspoon of salt. And you want to put that in a about a one cup's worth of water, and you want to boil them, get them into a rolling boil, and... Uh, get them going pretty good, and uh, the essence of the celery, the carrots, and the onions will come out into the water, and that is your broth. So we're, we're doing it the, uh, the old-fashioned way. And you could add uh, other aromatic vegetables to that if you know what they are and you wanted to, but this, this will do it. The onions really do the big work and uh, the heavy lifting, and so do uh, the, the celery. So you've got your russet potatoes, these aren't, I'm just making a joke here. Rust potatoes are huge, and it's a different texture uh, potato. It's a fluffy potato. It's a baking potato. You can use them, or you can use any kind you want. We're using uh, golden potatoes, and they're good. And you can use red potatoes if you want. It doesn't matter, because when you boil them, uh, you're going to end up skinning them, and then you're going to mash them. So my wife has uh, already pre-cooked our, our potatoes, and she's... Now whizzing them up with our mixer, and she's added just a little bit of the broth in there, and the, the salt is in there, and that's just adding some liquid. So if you're going to make mashed potatoes non-vegan, you'd probably add milk, you know, give them that, the liquid and, and that, uh, but that, that's an option. We're, we're doing vegan, so we're using the broth, and that's, that's the difference. Uh, this is pretty good, so stick to the recipe. So she's whizzing up the potatoes. They're, they're, they're basically a whipped potato. Now, when we uh, add the main ingredient, because we've got the potatoes, that's your foundational uh, element, and then we've made the broth. 
you want to shop for a nice head of cabbage. And right now, this is cabbage season, and it's uh, inexpensive. We have a head of cabbage. Uh, I personally have cut this up. <laughs> so a good cabbage is about the size of a human head, and it's about eight pounds, and you can get them for around 69 cents a pound on sale. And you want to cut off a good hunk of the cabbage, and you want to kind of mince it down on your cutting board and get it down into a fine, a fine form. Don't make it clunky. You want to cut it down thin because the cabbage is going to cook down when you, when you prepare it. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. So uh, with the cabbage and onions. and onions, we want to cut uh, how many onions we want to... Uh, Yeah, we were using this size onions. These are uh, normal red dry onions. And uh, we'll use uh, two or three according to um, the number of people you intend to serve. So you want to peel your onions. You want to cut them up very fine. Not, you want to do a little bit better than dicing them uh, to get them going. So you put your cabbage in a frying pan like this. You add some oil, uh, a little bit of water. And the cabbage is going to impart its own water. Then you add the onions and the cabbage, and you, I'm going to say saute them together, but you're going to cook the cabbage down. The cabbage is going to uh, dehydrate. It's going to impart its water in there. Uh, it's going to reduce in size. So if you think you got a lot of cabbage, you really got a little cabbage. And I think somebody else mentioned uh, kale or spinach. You could, you could add kale to this as well, or you could add spinach to it. We're using just cabbage... Uh, but your choice of, of the green um, vegetables. So, are we almost ready? Almost ready. So, big deal. We're cutting, um, we're cooking the potatoes, peeling them, mashing them. We're, we're making our broth in advance. We're kind of wetting that broth down to get just to the right consistency of mashed potatoes. And we're going to put in a layer in a baking dish without any grease uh, of the potatoes. So we're going to have a layer of potatoes, and then we're going to have a layer of the, uh, the cabbage-onion combination that we've cooked down. I want to cl clarify that we would have had more potatoes, except I left some of the mashed potatoes at home, so we have less than we should. But anyway. So we're going to put the layer of uh, potatoes, again, then the cabbage on top of that, and then we're going to top off the cabbage. So basically, two-thirds on the first layer of potatoes, then lay your cabbage on there, however it goes, and the potatoes are going to suck up whatever residual moisture that you're going to have. Then you top it off with another layer of potatoes. The last one-third of the potatoes go on top of, it, of that, and then you pop it in the oven, and you bake it for about 25, 30 minutes at, uh, what, 300? 350. 350. Make sure you watch it. Uh, and that's all there is to it. So this is not really a casserole. It's a potato dish. Um, I didn't grow up on this. I should have with my last name. Uh, but we didn't because my mom was not Irish. But my dad was. But he didn't cook. Cook snails. Anyways. So any questions on this? Yes, ma'am. What kind of did you say? Three, 300, 350. Keep an eye on it, though. You want to you brown it. Just a little bit. You want to just warm it up because everything has been prepared outside of the oven. It's just going to keep it warm, and, and then you can serve it. And it's a, uh, there's a lot of vitamins in cabbage and potatoes. That is a European staple, and uh, I think you'll like the recipe. Thank you. Thank you, Mick and Melissa. Now, as we transition over to our next recipe, we're going to have Sarah come on up and show us a lentil loaf. And just as a quick note um, for our, especially important for anyone who is looking to practice more of a vegan or a whole foods plant-based diet, the foods that we are, all of the recipes today are vegan. I just forgot to add a V to the cold cannon recipe, but all the recipes are vegan. So enjoy. And then give us just one more moment as we transition between demonstrations.
you're going to be sauteing. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, today I'm going to be making a vegan lentil loaf. Um, so it could be like the main dish at your Thanksgiving, um, just like a holiday loaf or something like that. So first, um, everything's pre-cooked, but we um, just cook some lentils. We have one and a half cups of lentils. Um, so that's just, it says about four and a half cups of water for one and a half cups of lentils. Um, but I think we should start sauteing first. So we're just gonna use some olive oil. and we'll wait for that to warm up. So we're gonna be putting everything into a food processor. Um, so we can add here. So one and a half cups of lentils. And then we set aside about six tablespoons of lentils so they don't get blended up for more texture. And then we have um, already chopped up one whole onion. Actually, it's two onions. Can you open this? And I don't think I have my garlic up here. But um, the recipe calls for two cloves of garlic. I did four because I like garlic. Oh, it's mixed. It's mixed in there. Okay. So there's four cloves of garlic and there's two onions in there already. Yeah. No. Oh, saute. Then we're also going to set the carrots, but we'll do that first and for about for a couple minutes, and then we'll add in the chopped carrots. And in the meantime, I will just tell you about the gravy because um, we, don't, we don't have time to make the gravy up here today, but we did make it beforehand, which we sauteed one onion, um, carrot, again, two celery stalks, garlic, uh, it calls for one clove, but again, I did four, um, two tablespoons of tomato paste, flour, we used uh, grape juice, one, and one fourth cups of vegetable broth, a half teaspoon of oregano, a teaspoon of paprika, 
half teaspoon of rosemary, and then salt and pepper. And then we sauteed everything um, and added the broth and then added um, flour and then it got all the flavors together and then we strained it through um, a strainer with really small holes and then we pushed it through until it was just the liquid that we had and it's really good. I've never made um, homemade gravy like that before. So now we're gonna put in the carrots. And then that was one large carrot. So yeah, we're just gonna do that first because we're supposed to blend it up and then add the spices afterwards. Um, and we'll add, I can add the walnuts. So there's three fourths cups of walnuts. And two tablespoons of tomato paste. scrape that into there. And so now we're going to add our sauteed vegetables into the food processor. And also before we add the spices, we're going to add um, a two tablespoons of ground flax seeds, which acts like an egg replacement to keep it um, from falling apart. I know. The skillet is very heavy, but it's a really good one. Okay, so I'm going to just process this for a little bit, and you don't want it to be too processed because it's better when it has more texture. So yeah, you still want it to have texture because <laughs> Okay, so now I'm going to add it to this bowl to mix the seasonings into it. Okay. So the seasonings that we have are two 
teaspoons of oregano. Two teaspoons of thyme. And two teaspoons of rosemary. And then two tablespoons of fresh parsley. That looks like more than two tablespoons, but it's okay. And then, um, so I forgot to add the milk, but it's okay, we can add it now. So this is just almond milk, and it is, um, how much? It's one third cup and one tablespoon. And then we'll add soy sauce. So two teaspoons of soy sauce. The other day I accidentally added two tablespoons, but it was still good. So but we're gonna add two teaspoons. <laughs> And then just some salt and pepper. Um, I don't really have exact measurements for it, but just some. And then we also added some red pepper, but I'll just add a little bit. It just depends on how spicy you like it. I would probably taste it along the way to see if it needs anything else. And then, yes, okay. So now I'm gonna mix it up. Another thing that um, I forgot to do, um, is that you also add in your oats into the food processor, but I'll also add that now. <laughs> and then we're gonna line um, the pan with parchment paper. And put it in the pan and then it's going to cook for an hour at 350. It's pretty, so it, we really liked it when we made it. Um, we tried a different loaf first that didn't have flaxseed and it was kind of falling apart, but with this one, it was really good, it stayed together since it had the flax seed in it. And it's really good with the homemade gravy that we made too. So I'm excited to eat it later. Okay, and then spread it evenly in the pan. And then we'll just put it in the oven. And then that's it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Parsley is two tablespoons as yeah. well? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. 
And you mentioned in the gravy, uh, you also do one celery stock. Mm -hmm. All right, so we can just add it to the recipe. I think it's missing. Oh, in the gravy? Um, yes. Or two. So it's two celery two. stalks okay. chopped into small pieces. But you don't really have to worry about it being perfect because you're just going to be, like, Mashing getting the... It. Yeah, and yeah. getting the flavor out. Thank you. That way. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're All right. Another round of applause. Thank you. Okay. Then as we transition into our final demonstration, and to give you just a quick look at um, who's next, we have Victor, who is going to be showcasing a dessert, a very simple but very delicious sounding dessert. So stay tuned and then just give us one more minute so that we can make sure that everything is transitioned smoothly. I guess we're all ready for dessert now. So, it's how we think that will get us places. It's how we think, and uh, in thinking, uh, we become resourceful. This right here is a crock pot, and it um, showcases the wonders of clay. Uh, we are emphasizing health and nutrition. And we are going to try to preserve not only nutrition and health and all that, but also flavor. So what, the, what clay does is that it preserves all of that. Um, this is easy, we all have a crock pot. I personally like using real clay pots and um, I enjoy uh, the real clay pots from the best place in Italy, which is the region of Umbria. And I can get all into why that, that's the best clay in Italy and all of that. Okay. Practical purposes, a crock pot. <laughs> um, in fall, we have the abundance of apples and sweet potatoes. So that's what we do. Uh, because we're trying to be health conscious, then we don't worry about sugar. Because this is natural sugar, and it's low glycemic. 
So, uh, to preserve the flavor, again, we are going to cook it slowly. Back in the day, um, everything was put in clay pots, people had to work the fields, and they just let things cook it slowly, and when they would come back from work, working the fields, they had a nice meal and everything was flavorful. So this is cooked slowly, the same amount of apples to the same proportions of apples and sweet potatoes. Another uh, variation that you can do is a yam. Um, these are fall colors, and that's basically it. Now, the trick, add the layers, which one is stronger, which one will fall apart faster, so we put the potatoes or the yams at the bottom first. We peel them, we dice them, well, we cut them in smaller, um, medium-sized cubes. And then on top of that come the sweetest uh, apples that you can find. Um, you peel everything, obviously, and then you add the cinnamon. And in a matter of less than three hours, or maybe, let's say, yeah, two and a half, it should be ready. Or you just leave it overnight, and that will aromatize the whole house, you know? So, <laughs> so this is ready for the guests. And um, now, if you want more sugar, that will be up to you. But as is, um, I think it's great. Now, uh, something that you might consider is texture. What do you want it to look like when you serve it? And that's where you become creative and use a Vitamix or a very strong blender or a very strong mixer. Um, I made it as simple as possible so that you can have an idea of what it will look like and uh, then you, it's up to you to you know, add more sugar, or, and then you serve it with um, cinnamon sticks, or, um, or a little bit more, maybe um, pecans or walnuts when in, in the smaller cups. But um, any questions? Yes, sir. There's alternative cooking instructions for non Crock pot owners? Um, okay. <clears throat> Metal will change the flavor of things. If you don't have a crock pot, it is not the end of the world. Um, use uh, surgical steel if you have access to that. We're talking about flavor. Now, if you don't mind flavor, hey, use a regular pot. Would I, would I bake it and at what temperature and for how long? <clears throat> well, y yes, you can always bake the potato. The problem is that it, it, it becomes more dry. And so it's going to be a lot of muscle, <laughs> you know, because you're going to mash everything. The crock pot, what it does is that it blends. Uh, um, the water um, changes the texture uh, in, a, in, a, in a less rough way so that you're able to, you know, it's more liquid. But if you, it, it's true, if you want to make it more thicker, and then, of course, you can bake it. It's just the mashing. You, you're blending flavors into different textures, one stronger, uh, one thicker than the other. Yes, Carmen? Are you using any water? Yes, water is in here. Oh. Yeah. Um, it depends on how thick you want it. I used uh, one third of this crock pot because the, the, you realize that the apple has water, you know. So when you are cooking it here, the, the, the apples is going to sweat a little. And that's what you're looking for. You want the flavors to blend, you know, the, the, the juice of the apple plus um, then the, the juice of the sweet potato. Any other questions? Um, so I just want to make sure you said a third cup of water for the two sweet potatoes and the two apples. Is that right? 
for, the, uh, for this uh, exact well, recipe, in other words. Uh, 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 meaning uh, proportions. Uh, in a crock pot, because I, I put, you know, 50-50, so I put one third of water on, in, in this space. Okay. For, for the two sweet potatoes and the two apples, is that right? Yes, but that's why oh. There's no okay. I just want to make sure I'm clear. Yes, um, so I would say, yeah, something like that. One, one third, one third, uh, one third of water, so it would be ugh, in the crock pot, two and two, um, that's four, so one third of four, kind of, um, one and a half, correct, thank you, that, that looks right, but slowly cooked. So, obviously, <clears throat> um, what we're looking at is proportions. So, yes, I have a David. question. Yes. Um, I know you're very precise in, <laughs> about everything you do, and there's always a reason. What type of apple have you found works the best? The sweetest. The sweetest oh, so you, you can find. you want to go as sweet as possible. You, you, yeah, yeah. And this is why I said it depends on how sweet you want to do it. Some people don't want the sweet apple. They want a more tart. Then you go for, you know, more towards the green okay. apple. Okay. Which is... Thank you. So I went for the sweetest that I found. Which is... Which is um, honey crisps. Honey, yeah. you know. <laughs> the ones you make applesauce with also. Yes. Um, so... I guess two questions. So you're thinking two and a half to three hours on low in the crock pot? High, like if, high, on high. high. So two and a half to yeah, three hours on high. Low is not going to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> low is going to make you desperate and, and hungry and, um, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it won't cook it. <laughs> um, and then you mash it to your desired consistency. So it should almost be like an apple sauce. A chunky apple chunky sauce. Chunky apple sauce. Yeah. Um, could you eat it or have you tried it without mashing? Like just eating it, the chunks? Uh, no, because... Um, the flavors aren't blending. And the textures. Okay. And it, it's, it's uh, yeah, it, it, you want texture and flavor blended, okay. you know. Like some type of consistency. When you go like this... You don't have, you don't want your brain to, your taste buds to be going, oh, this is apple and here's the sweet potato. You want the joint, yeah, the togetherness of flavor and texture. Yes, question here. The mic. <laughs> can you freeze it? Oh, you can absolutely freeze it, absolutely. But why would you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, okay, let's talk about that um, precisely. And I think this is the magic of clay. Um, you calculate the amount of people, and then it's served fresh. The minute you freeze anything, you are recooking or burning texture, flavor, and nutrients. So stay away from the heat, stay away from the cold when it comes to, and from the metal. Um, to preserve nutrients, flavors, and textures. And this is why clay is wonderful. In hot weather, a clay pot cools the water, you know, and in heat, the, 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 the clay uniforms the heat. In, in warm, uh, yeah, in warmth, the clay unifies the heat. Yes, Karen. And then this will be our final question. Actually, it's just a comment, you know, you, we can sweeten it with sugar, you said, but I try something similar and I used a little maple syrup, just a touch of it and it's also yummy. Correct, and, and this is why I said, well, what you're looking for is um, sweetness or texture or what, what, are, you, what are you interested in, in presenting to your guests or to yourself? You know, if you want sugar, that's what you do. And then sugar, you can go into the maples or the sugars or the Yam syrup. And speaking of presentation, Victor, could you open up the crock pot so our friends online can take a look at our wonderful dish right dun, here? Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Wonderful. Thank you so much.
All right, so now at this time, uh, thank you, Victor. Round of applause for Victor. All right, so let's see. Am I visible if I, yes, okay, I'm visible if I stand right here. I'm very short. Um, so that is all that we have today for all of you who are tuning in online. That is the end of our demonstrations. And so now what we're going to do is transition over into the recipe sampling. And so if you were only able to join online, hopefully we'll get to see you one day. But then for all of our friends who are here in person, we're going to enjoy the recipes now. If you try out the recipes, feel free to go ahead and let us know what you thought. A couple of quick event announcements. Um, the first one is actually this coming Sunday, the 20th at 4.30. We're going to have here at our church a wonderful open Thanksgiving dinner. Bring your friends, bring your family, bring your neighbor. Unless you don't like them, then, I mean, well, you can always bring them too and then send them off to someone else to chat with them. But we would love to have you here. We're going to have kind of more of like the traditional layout of the menu. You have your mashed potatoes, green bean casserole, things like that. So we would love to see you here. And then the next event that we are going to have is December 4th. That is our next health event. We're going to be having a health expert or let's see, what is his title? There we go. Daniel is an Olympic weightlifting coach. He's a nutrition specialist. He's a health expert. And he's going to be showing us a little bit more about how to stay physically fit not just the nutritionally healthy, but also the physical aspect of health, particularly when it starts to get cold, you don't wanna go outside, maybe you just don't want to really leave the space of your home, right? So we're going to live stream that, and we're also going to be here in this space as he demonstrates some of the activities and exercises that you could try out. All levels of fitness are welcome. Don't worry, I'm going to be right there. So if you're going to struggle, you will not struggle alone. But that is everything that we have for today. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.